What's up boys and girls? This is Spit Logic and today I want to talk about lo-fi hip hop. What is lo-fi hip hop? Is it a particular sound? Is it the end result of that sound? Or is it a little bit more involved? Does it involve the process in order to get that particular sound of what we know as lo-fi hip hop? I think to discuss that topic, you know, number one, it's important to talk about the origins, the the way that lo-fi hip hop came to be about and, you know, what were the circumstances surrounding it to help create the subgenre of hip hop music. So let's start off with hip hop music back in the 80s. And, you know, the, the thing about hip hop back then is that it was really relegated to a few very small regions in the country. Um, it wasn't a lot of people making hip hop music. Therefore, you had a very small group of people that kind of had a monopoly on what hip hop music is supposed to sound like. Essentially, you had kind of a singular sound of what rap music, hip hop music sounded like back then. So there wasn't a lot of people producing hip hop music. If you fast forward back to the 90s, to the early 2000s, hip hop becomes this global phenomena that has touched so many people. And you're talking about 10, 15 years down the line where a lot of people who were children listening to hip hop and coming from all these diverse backgrounds are now inspired to create their own kind of hip hop. So you go from this very small niche group of people in these very distinct regional areas to people overseas, people in other parts of the country now being inspired to make music, but having a different background and therefore acquiring a different taste and a different sound to the music that they were producing. Also around that time, uh, a lot of hip hop artists, a lot of hip hop music were branching out and combining different genres. You had rock and roll combined with hip hop music. You had R&B combined with hip hop music. A lot of different genres, opera, you know, orchestral music. Everyone was, was pulling a lot of different influences from other genres of music and then adapting that to a hip hop feel to it. I think one of the, the most closely aligned genres with lo-fi music was like the chill, down-tempo kind of music that was created around the, around the 90s and, and in the early 2000s. In addition to all these subgenres being mixed and mashed with hip-hop music, I would say that there were three very distinct elements that brought lo-fi hip-hop into its own subgenre within the realm of hip-hop music. So the number one element that I would say contributed most to the creation of lo-fi hip hop would have to be the SP series, the SP 202, the 303, and the 404. This was a sampler, a machine that was used by a lot of hip hop producers back in the day, but it was used in conjunction with the MPC. And those, those SP, especially when we started with the 202, it had a lo-fi effect feature on it. So you could take the original sample and then by pushing that lo-fi button, it kind of degraded the quality of the sample and kind of gave it a more humanistic, warm tone to it. It it invited the environmental noise. You know, you could hear like more of a hum in the actual sample. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about lo-fi music in general. We're talking about kind of humanizing music, whether it is making the sample sound like it has inconsistencies in the vinyl that you just sampled, you can hear the crackling and the popping in it, or playing a melody and not playing it perfectly, getting a few keys a little bit off, or even the drum itself where the drum isn't exactly on point and on tempo. The second element that I think contributed a lot to creating the lo-fi hip hop subgenre would be the iconic producers. And I think there's three in particular that, that come to mind. Number one, I would talk about Madlib. I think, 
I think for me, I never even heard of the SP until I heard an interview with Mad Lib. He came across, and, and this was also late 90s, early 2000s. This is a time where kind of that underground hip hop movement started. And he was one of the very few producers that would sit down and give a lot of praise specifically to the SP, whether it was the 303 or the 404. I think that, that him bringing attention to that and then the way that his music sounded, specifically if I talk about the Mad Villainy album, him and Metal Face Doom, I think that kind of highlighted a different texture and a different sound that wasn't really heard or appreciated as much, but it became very popular and it just caught on really quickly. The second producer who I would give a lot of credit to would be Jay Dilla. And even though I think Jay Dilla's music was a little more refined, he had a little bit more going on in a lot of his beats, it was still a very organic kind of synthesized bass lines that you would hear, these, these sub hard hitting bass lines. But the quality of the samples that he chose a lot of producers would try to clean up their samples to where you would just hear the music in the sample. Jay Dilla was the kind of person that would take just the full sample and it might be someone humming or about to say something in the song and he, he would keep it in there. And it was just that, that kind of organic um, rawness of the sample which made his music so attractive because he kept all these different elements in the sample and you could hear it and it would still repeat over and over again, but it enhanced the actual beat itself. I would also say that the way he did a lot of the drumming, it was just different, different patterns of drums that had never really been heard before. A lot of us around that time were just used to the very basic kind of boom bap cadence on drums. Jay Dilla had a way of doing drums a lot differently and doing his percussion a lot differently and just kind of looping it. And, and some of his music was very, had a lot of space, a lot of air in the beats, but then some of it would have this deep bass line, this deep sub bass line that would carry the entire song. So I think, I think a lot of lo-fi hip hop that you hear now, especially when you hear those sub bass lines, you know, you can attribute that to a lot of people being inspired by Jay Dilla. The third producer that I would like to highlight is Nujabees. I think that his, the element that he brought to the table with lo-fi hip hop was not only using some really good sub bass textures, he used a lot of keys and using a lot of key bass samples but he also experimented with a lot of ambient type of sounds, a lot of warm and experimental textures in the sounds that he used. That kind of sound, if you listen to a lot of the Nujabees music, it, it was molded in such a way to where there was this weird mix of energy, but it was also just kind of calming with the way that the bass line and the melodies fit together. I would say that between Dilla and the Nujabees, they both had this very high energy, but very calming and soothing kind of texture to their music. And that is kind of what lo-fi hip hop is, right? It has this, this underscoring smooth and mellowness to it, to where a lot of people are saying that lo-fi is the kind of music you should study with. It's the kind of music you should be reading within the background. And Nujubees, I think, did that best because he brought in a lot of those ambient textures and ambient library sounds and he put them in kind of a hip hop format. My first time listening to Nujubees was the soundtrack that they created for the Samurai Champlo show on Adult Swim. And this brings me to the third element, which I think was a very main contributor to lo-fi hip hop, and that is Adult Swim. I can remember specifically, there would be these segments, these promos for new shows, and they would show, you know, different scenes, but there would be like this melody in the background of it. Or, you know, William Street, which was the production company uh, behind Adult Swim, 
they would just it would just be these steel photos, these steel frames that was in this like sepia tone kind of grungy kind of photograph. And then they would have the beat in the background. And it would be, again, this low key, maybe some upright bass, maybe some sub bass, and just like this old school kind of drum loop just going over and over again in the background. A lot of people watched Adult Swim back in the early 2000s. And it's 2022. So a lot of people back when they were teenagers or even younger who were watching that and constantly being inuated with, with that music, right now they're, they're adults. And it's something about those keys, those melodies, you know, those drum loops, you know, the kind of distorted, kind of grainy feel and sound to it that gives a nostalgic feeling to a lot of people when they listen to it. And that's essentially what, what lo-fi hip hop has created. It has created this nostalgic kind of setting to where you hear something familiar enough to bring you back to a, a time where you were much younger, much more innocent, but it's something a little bit different. It's not the exact same thing that you remember, but it still brings back those same feelings. So that brings me back to my question. What is lo-fi hip hop? Is it just the end result? Can I use Fruity Loops or Ableton Live? And as long as it sounds like lo-fi hip hop, that's exactly what it is. Or is it the process? Do I have to use dusty vinyl? Do I have to program my drums without quantization? What is lo-fi hip hop? What do you think? Do you think it's, it's more about the process or is it more about the end result? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and until next time. Peace.